hypoxia. It's a new, old, disruptive technology. Okay, so we can see here that basically we're going to talk about it with a hyperoxic chaser. Now, I want to introduce to you guys what I think should be the mascot for RADFest and everything else. And it was mentioned yesterday in brief terms by Dr. Church. The bowhead whale. Bowhead whales are in the ocean right now that were alive when James Madison or James Monroe was president. Some were even alive before the Declaration of Independence was signed. So why do they have such longevity? Two main reasons among others. They do intermittent fasting. They live in an ocean that's very cold and not too much food and they practice intermittent hypoxia. Notice I said intermittent, okay. What does it do? What do those two things do together? They basically increase the health and number of your mitochondria. So that's an important aspect of things. So let's look at some interesting facts about hypoxia. You know, when we develop in our mothers, we're basically at a PO2 of between 16,000 and 19,000 feet. If you look at the Hunts Valley, they live at 8,000 feet, and they live 15 to 20 years longer than the rest of us. You look at the Andes, when they do autopsies, after 8,000 feet, they don't find any heart disease at all. So something's going on there. So, and is this an important um, field? You betcha. Nobel Prize in 2019 for how cells sense oxygen. So it's an important aspect of things. So now, do we know anything about this? Have we been exposed to it? Sure we have. Intermittent hypoxia comes from a you know, or a former Soviet Union. A lot of science, a lot of longevity stuff, you know, came from the, the Soviets. Remember how they were so good in sports for all those years and things like that. So what is intermittent hypoxia? It's basically repeated episodes of hypoxia with intervening periods of recovery. Now, again, we all know this. Think about it. You know these elite athletes. What do they do? They want to go train in Denver. Why? Because it's a mile high and that does something good for them. And you can see here what are some of the things that happen. So physical exercise combined with hypoxia, it's a real powerful anti-aging booster. Again, you can see some of the things about intermittent hypoxia, some of the pathways in, in the body that it uh, can take care of. It, it does so many different things. It's, it's just an amazing thing. So how can we actually do this? Well, there's two forms of intermittent hypoxia that each and every one of us can do. First, there's local hypoxia, and then there's systemic hypoxia. Okay, so let's do the local one first. You know, I take care of a lot of pro athletes. I've been an orthopedic surgeon. We do something called blood flow restriction, where we use certain type of tourniquets. We'll put it on an extremity. Then it'll sense your blood pressure, and then it'll kind of restrict a certain part of your blood pressure. By doing that, what are we getting? Okay, we're getting increased IGF-1, increased myostatin blockers, which is the holy grail of some bodybuilders, et cetera. So let's look at what happens there. Okay, so we can see here some of the things that happen, okay? But let's look at this next slide. This is a really great slide. So let's look at high intensity exercise versus blood flow restriction and low intensity versus low intensity. Now, when we look at that, we see muscle damage. Well, okay, blood flow restriction, low intensity, no muscle damage, great, okay. But let's look at some other things here. Growth hormone. We do high intensity, we get about a 100-fold increase that we would from normal circumstances. But if we do blood flow restriction, we get 1.7 times greater than that. IGF-1, a significant increase versus an increase. mTOR, we just talked about mTOR, significant increase. Okay, myostatin, down regulation. Myostatin, remember, makes your body produce fat, not muscle. So, and also, last but not least, 12 weeks for high intensity, two weeks for blood flow restriction. So now you start seeing a sense, hey, there's something to what this guy is saying. This blood flow restriction and this intermittent hypoxia has some really cool stuff about it. Now, let's kind of look between the differences between chronic hypoxia and intermittent hypoxia, because that's important. Chronic hypoxia is indeed associated with cancer. It's associated with sleep apnea, whereas intermittent hypoxia is a cyclic reduction of blood oxygen. And again, what we need to talk about, and it's such an important aspect of everything we're talking about in this meeting, it's the hormesis effect. It's of paramount importance. And we can see that right here. You know, if we look at this 
ta this table, this illustration, we can see here that if you have some hypoxia, not much happens. But when you get that intermittent hypoxia, where it's um, a little higher, you get some really good optimal gains. Then when you start getting more hypoxia, then you start getting some severe problems. But let's look at that a little better, okay? The hormesis effect, we get that certain concentration. Remember, hormesis effect affects everything. The amount of oxygen you get. How about your blood glucose? Too high, too low? It's fatal. So it's the hormesis effect, and that's why I'm saying here, and that's why I said oxidative stress is a good thing, because some oxidative stress makes you healthier. You don't want to get rid of all of it, okay? So we can see it here. Low dose stress, adaptive response, repair mechanism, an improved guy, okay? High dose, cell damage, okay? So this is a landmark article, and this is one article I suggest you guys all read, okay? What does intermittent hypoxia do? They compared intermittent hypoxia and chronic hypoxia. Okay, intermittent hypoxia induced telomere reverse transcriptase. Interesting, how do you like that? So you mean if I use intermittent hypoxia, my immune system's gonna get younger? Yes, exactly. That's so, so you know, astounding, so to speak. All right, so basically hypoxia is a very powerful inducer of gene expression. When all said and done, most everything we do, we're trying to manipulate those genes. It helps do transcription factors, which I'll get into shortly. Metabolic changes, we just heard on our last lecture how mTOR, well, this does affect mTOR. It affects AMPK and a couple of other things. Also angiogenesis, the making of blood vessels. And last but not least, stem cell proliferation, migration and differentiation. Very important things. Okay, so let's get into it a little more. So basically what happens is we get something called hypoxia inducible factors. These are transcription factors. Remember, a transcription factor hangs out in the cytoplasm, gets in the nucleus and says, hey, you make these things, we need them. And that's what happens here. Okay, so basically there are hypoxic inducible factors. There's three types. We know about the first two. We don't know that much about the last one, uh, A3, and we're still learning about it. So let's kind of see how that thing hangs out there. So when we have these hypoxia inducible factors in the cytoplasm, they typically will get destroyed because oxygen will go over there, it'll give them some OH groups, some hydroxyl groups, next thing you know, they go on and they are made into peptides and things. However, if that oxygen is low, lo and behold, what happens is that hypoxia inducible factor can escape the destruction from the oxygen, and it gets in the nucleus, and it forms something called hypoxia reduce, um, uh, response elements. What does it do? And you can see on this one, for instance, it makes erythropoiesis. We'll get into that shortly. It makes interesting changes in our metabolism and does angiogenesis. So, again, here's these hypoxia response elements. Now, if we would look at the bottom there, we start saying, hey, these are things that are really important in anti-aging. You know, angiogenesis, erythropoiesis, cell proliferation, survival, glucose metabolism, pH regulation, proteolysis. Wow, a lot of interesting things there. Now, again, we can see all the things here. You go with this, this is, the, this is the Rosetta Stone of aging right here. If we can get certain of these things to be in our favor, we're gonna really have some good things. So let's talk a little bit about erythropoietin. Now, erythropoietin is what got Lance Armstrong in trouble. Why? Blood doping, but it's a lot more than blood doping. That was kind of what was on the surface. But let's look at some of the other things that erythropoietin does. It stabilizes the mitochondrial membrane. It reduces formation of reactive oxygen species and nitrogen oxygen species. So basically, it can do a lot of interesting things. It can enhance performance, and it can do it legally in an athlete, which is interesting. So we can see here, what does EPO do? Well, the endothelium. Dr. Bryant was talking about nitric oxide, endothelial nitric oxide in particular. Okay, then basically the brain, the heart, the myoblast, the fat, it can make brown fat, and your bone, it can help your bone remodel. It can actually help in osteoporosis and things like that. Okay, so basically we have something called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, very important growth factor in the stem cell world. It basically helps us make blood vessels. And, and I want to give a little thing because a lot of docs that are in the stem cell field don't even know this. The difference between angiogenesis and vasculogenesis. In angiogenesis, we're going to build upon blood vessels that are already there. And for instance, if I use a PRP, that is something that can help it. But in vasculogenesis, you're making new blood vessels. 
You're making blood vessels that weren't there. That can help heal tissue and things like that. Unfortunately, sometimes it could be a problem in cancers. All right, but there's another effect that has uh, hypoxia inducible factors, something called hemoxygenase 1. This is a very important enzyme in our body. And basically, it's a transcription factor to produce this. Now, it can have profound effects on something called our macrophages. And people just think of macrophages as one thing, that basically all it does is go after bacteria or go after viruses and just get them. That's called a macrophage 1, OK? But there's another macrophage. It's a macrophage 2. And that does cell regeneration. So that's pretty interesting. You mean I can get my white blood cells to actually make new tissue? You betcha. OK, and that's called an M2. And you can see that here. Now, we can see that better in this illustration here. In the bottom, you can see there's an M1. And it, it's polarized to an M2 by these intermittent hypoxia factors. So, so important, such a profound effect on our immune system. But here's another very important thing that's going to kind of blow your minds a little bit. Okay? So what else this does is it breaks down in the hypoxia, excuse me, the biliverdin to bilirubin, and that's an antioxidant. And what else does it do? It produces carbon monoxide. You can't live without carbon monoxide in your body. Okay? How does that blow your mind? Again, the hormesis effect. Too much, it's going to bind your hemoglobin, you're going to die. But you need a certain amount. It's a singling molecule. There's three singling molecules. Nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen sulfide. These are important gassing cellulose molecules. We can't exist without them, period. Okay, so nitric oxide. Again, Dr. Bryant talked about that. And this is from the endothelial. This is the nitric oxide we like. You know, the one that's produced by the endothelium is the one that affects all sorts of things, including your bone marrow, to produce more stem cells, et cetera. So that's why it's so important. Another thing that these factors do, they make P53, OK? The tumor suppressor gene. That's a problem that many of us get. As time goes on, our P53s either disappear or they're a problem. We don't have multiple copies. That's why an elephant, for instance, it has multiple copies of the P53. An elephant almost never gets cancer because it can have all these P53s. So this can help stimulate our P53s. But what else does it do? This will help preserve your stem cells. You know, stem cells don't like to really do a lot of work. They kind of want to just sit on the sidelines until they're needed. So they basically are quiescent cells. And this helps preserve what we call their stemness. It makes them stay as a stem cell because a stem cell basically uses glycolysis for energy. Once it has to differentiate, it goes into oxidative phosphorylation. It needs a lot more. So it, it's very important, and it keeps the stem cells from basically differentiating. Now, here's another interesting thing. One of the things we use in my office quite a bit, very small embryonic-like stem cells. We'll take about 250 cc's of your blood. We'll process it, put it at 4 degrees centigrade, which is a magic number in biology, overnight, and give it back to you the next day. These cells make telomerase. These cells are essentially pluripotent. They're in each and every one of us, but they have to be stressed. We stress them by hypoxia, we stress them by cold, and we stress them by hypox hypoxia again. So here's some other things about the intermittent hypoxia. It has some profound effects on our body weight, our cell metabolism, cardiovascular, and respiratory, as you'd expect. Let's kind of talk a little bit about body weight, OK? So, those of you that have been skiing, you know when you get to that place, if you've been kind of at sea level, I live in Florida, so we're at sea level, you kind of get there, you say, man, yeah, you know, I kind of lost my appetite. It's altitude anorexia, because basically you're getting a little hypoxic there. Now, this intermittent hypoxia can have profound effects on a lot of our, you know, peptides that are basically in our gut, et cetera, and it can help with glucose uptake, et cetera, glycolysis. It can help with the control of ghrelin and leptin. Now, listen, there's going to be a tidal wave coming soon with all the people that have been on these semiglutides. And, and look, my nurse practitioner gives it to a lot of my patients. But eventually, when these people get off, they're going to have that rebound weight gain. Intermittent hypoxia will help that. And I'll give you another little pearl I'll throw out there. Take your patients and give them low-dose naltrexone. Works very well to just suppress the appetite. OK, so basically, um, we can see some of the things here of the hypoxia 
Hyperoxia, that's another little clue that we can do. Let's not just say, okay, let's go from 9% to 20% oxygen. Let's go from 9% maybe to 40% oxygen. We start getting some very interesting things here. We can see how, for instance, it lowers your cholesterol, lowers your glucose, increases insulin sensitivity. Boy, I mean, all these lectures, they, they just were a great prelude for me because they're telling me, you know, all these things that I'm looking for and I can get in one modality. But you've got to do more than just one modality. Remember, that's just, you know, not the thing. So what are some of the other pathways that it stimulates? Well, the AMPK and sirtuins. I mean, you can't get much more important than the sirtuin pathways. And it targets basically many different streams, downstream targets. It stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis. Most every disease we've been talking about at this meeting, when all is said and done, it's because our mitochondria are failing us. This can make them stronger. This can make them grow in number, et cetera. So that's some of the good things that we really like here. So anyway, there's myokines, okay? They're basically growth factors from muscles. You know, these the old saying, a sound body leads to a sound mind. Well, look at this here, okay? BDNF, you know, one of the real good growth factors for the brain. And this is just gonna increase that. Now, if you wanna take it to the next level, what I'm starting to do now, I'm gonna do blood flow restriction and I'm gonna do something with a body suit where basically I'm using electrical stimulation at the same time. What, what's happening there? Well, that body suit basically clotho-protein because of the electrical stimulation. So interesting to see. So maybe if I come back as the Hulk in another year or so, we'll see what happens, okay? Anyway, uh, systemic hypoxia. That's what we do in my office a lot. So in systemic hypoxia, we go from about 9% oxygen to 40%. We keep, you know, isolating it and vacillating it, okay? The sessions can run 10 to 90 minutes. I typically will do about a 30 minute uh, session in my office in Boca. And it's tailored to the patients. Now here's some conditions where it can actually be beneficial. You know, this is, you know, not that interesting to most people. Um, but basically here's some contraindications. Now, here's a particular machine that we're using in my office, okay? And it, that's what it looks like. But let's look at some values here, okay? So you really need to get below 90% PO2 to really have an effect. So that's, what, that's our target range. That's called the uh, hypoxia therapeutic index. Now, we usually look to go from 75 to 89. A lot of times my PO2, when I'm doing these procedures at the end of the day, it'll be 75. You guys look at me, you'll say, wait a minute, this guy has to be transferred to the ICU and intubated. His PO2 is 75. Not a problem, okay? Really not a problem at all. And what we really affect here is we're affecting something called the oxygen disassociation curve. You know, for me as an orthopedic surgeon, I say, what the hell is that? You know, orthopedic surgeons, we're as strong as a horse and twice as smart. But I've kind of figured some of these things out, okay? So anyway, you can see this oxygen curve here. Now, the hypoxia basically makes it go to the left. So you have increased oxygen affinity and no real increase unloading. Okay, and that's what we want. We want to get those cells stressed. Okay, now here's some interesting things to tie it in. There was a very famous Israeli study with hyperbaric oxygen. They were using hyperbaric oxygen and basically they gave the patients air breaks. What do I mean? The patient's basically in a compressed, atmosphere, compressed room air atmosphere, not 100% pure oxygen, but they're breathing pure oxygen from a mask. Then what the Israelis said is, take that mask off for five minutes and just breathe regular room air. It's that bouncing around that's really causing the thing. Now, what did they find? They found, just as I said earlier, that basically it helped cause the immune system to become younger. It lengthened the telomeres. So you don't have to necessarily have that big, fancy um, hyperbaric chamber. You can basically do it with a you know, hypoxia machine. So hypoxia is a natural trigger of mitogenesis, mitochondrial changes. It helps with endothelial growth factors. It helps with so many different pathways in the body. A and it's an easy thing to do, very safe, fairly inexpensive when all is said and done, and, and you can see all the things that it does here. I mean, this is just some of the, we're just touching the surface. I've spoke to one of the professors at Mayo. He's really doing a lot of work with this. There's a lot of universities now that are kind of catching wind of this. This is gonna be something you're gonna hear more and more about. So I have 20 seconds left, so I like to quote my good friend Aristotle. Those that know do, but those that understand will teach, number one. And one more, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So hopefully that's it. Thank you so much, guys.